Hello, Norway family. Hey, it's great to be together again, and I'm really excited to share some, some news and some developments on uh, how we're moving forward with our Sunday services. Uh, hopefully, you have enjoyed the, the videos that we've produced uh, each week. Uh, I just have to give a huge shout out to our media team, uh, led by Andrew and Zach Chambers. Uh, th these guys are amazing. The work they've done each and every week is, is first class. And we, we love them so much and appreciate everything they're doing. Um, Mark Chambers with the website and Jaden, my son, uh, the work he's done putting our music together. Uh, it's been nothing short of spectacular. And uh, for everyone else that's had a hand in, in helping with it, we love you. We thank you so much for all, all you've done. Um, we're, we're looking forward to kind of moving into a, uh, a new phase of Sunday morning services as we, we continue to navigate our way through this pandemic season and, and get ready for, for what's coming next. Uh, the elders met recently and we have made the decision to err on the side of caution. We realize some churches are opening up and people are starting to come together, uh, but we, we are really concerned for many of the members of our church family who have compromised immune systems and uh, just, you know, there, there are so many complications and so many unknowns with this uh, with this COVID-19 and with this pandemic that, that there are more questions than we have answers for. So we are focused on doing what we feel is right and, and looking long-term for the, the best and most suitable time where we can come back together as a church family. You know, with, with the way we do church, it, it's, it's probably best that we continue to, to maintain uh, our uh, current per course and, and err on the side of caution. So we want to continue to bring weekly services in the most effective uh, format that we possibly can. So what we're thinking about doing, I hope, I hope you enjoy this. I hope it, it works out. We have some big plans and what, what we want to do is we want to begin broadcasting live every Sunday. And we're gonna do this from the Activity Center. So what, what we've done is we have set up a, 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 a stage area with a, a screen and uh, the band will come together. We will have, Jeff will be preaching. We will have communion devotionals. Uh, we will have other other special announcements. It'll almost feel like a real Sunday morning at Norway Avenue, but it will be broadcast live. The doors won't be open. You won't be allowed to come and, and be with us there in person, but we are going to broadcast this service beginning next Sunday uh, in, a, in a live format that you'll be able to tune into Sunday morning at 1030 and we can all be together. So we're really looking forward to, to that and we're going to do that through the month of June and we'll do that for the first weekend in July uh, for the uh, leading into the, uh, the July 4th holiday, Independence Day. And then we, we will follow that up with uh, more communication at that time assessing the situation and whether or not we feel it's safe to begin uh, bringing people together and worshiping in person and, and, and singing and hugging on one another, um, you know, as we're accustomed to doing. Um, no guarantees, no promises at this point, but we need everyone to just continue to pray, continue to pray, be diligent in prayer, church, as and ask God to continue to protect us. But, you know, looking, looking at this and being of a mindset that looks long-term and how we, we can safely navigate this pandemic season and come out on the end where we're, we're together and everyone's healthy and we can really advance the kingdom uh, here and, and answer the calling that the Lord has given us in this area. 
and uh, we're, we're really excited about it. I, I love you all so much, and I want you to continue to remain faithful in your giving. You are such an encouragement to me, church. I love you all so much. You know, it, it, in, in these times with all of the uncertainty and the struggles and the, the financial uh, stresses, uh, it is amazing how we have all shouldered the, the responsibility and, and answered the call. And you know, there, there are so many needs and so much that we're going to be able to do uh, as a result of your faithful uh, obedience to tithing and making your offerings on a weekly basis. So I, I love you, church. I love you. Thank you so much for that. So let's enjoy today's uh, video and all, all that's in store. And the, the band and Jeff and the media team will be working this week together to make preparations for next Sunday. Uh, next Sunday we will have a live video broadcast from uh, our building, from the Activity Center building, beginning at 1030. So mark your calendars for that. Watch. Jeannie's going to send out some emails and updates so that everyone's aware of how to, how to plug in and, and, and be a part of everything. So sorry for the long message. I get a little long-winded sometimes, but I'm really excited about this, and it's great to see everybody. I love you all so much. I miss you terribly, but stay safe. Be consistent. Let's, let's get through this together, okay? All glory to God. I love you, church. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn Till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my turn Till I
Luke 23, 33 says, And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. There's an old hymn that we used to sing growing up, especially it seemed in preparation for the Lord's Supper, called Lead Me to Calvary. The lyrics say this, King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy thorn-crowned brow, lead me to Calvary. Show me the tomb where thou wast laid, tenderly mourned and wept. Angels in robes of light arrayed, guarded thee whilst thou slept. Let me like Mary through the gloom come with a gift to thee. Show to me now the empty tomb, lead me to Calvary. May I be willing, Lord, to bear daily my cross for thee, even thy cup of grief to share, thou hast borne all for me. And the refrain says, lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. As I heard this song in my head and sang it randomly this week, there were three questions that came to my mind that I think are important for us to consider as we prepare our hearts and our minds for this supper. The title, the line that's repeated three times throughout the song says, lead me to Calvary. That calls me to think about the first two questions. Who is leading me and where am I being led? I would like to think that I'm being led by Jesus to the foot of the cross, to Calvary, but there are times in my life though that my thoughts and my words and my actions, they just don't reflect that. How about you? Then I think about another line that is repeated in the song, lest I forget. And it brings me to the third question to consider, how good is my memory? Now Amanda will tell you that my memory is less than impressive, much less. So many times throughout the day-to-day -day grind, I forget stuff. I also forget about things that uh, happened in the past that you would think would be stored in my long-term memory. My memory fails me all the time, plain and simple, so I can't rely on it all. In light of those three questions, who's leading me, where am I being led, and how good is my memory? I can see why this song has been so meaningful to so many people over the last 100 plus years. At this time, when we participate in the Lord's Supper and all throughout our lives, we need Jesus to lead us. We need to be led to the cross. And we need this so that our memories don't fail us, lest we forget the amazing sacrifice that was made on our behalf. I encourage you to pray now with your family or with whoever you're with as we partake in this communion.
Isaiah 53. Who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Please open your Bibles to Isaiah 53. Please follow along in your Bible as um, I preach this message. We're in a series of sermons called Finding Christ in the Old Testament. And this is sermon number eight. It's, the message is called The Gospel According to Isaiah. This is the, the high point of the Old Testament. This is the Mount Everest. This is the apex of the Old Testament. 
Sometimes it's called the fifth gospel. You know, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Isaiah 53. But it may be more appropriate to call it the first gospel because it was written 700 years before um, the incarnation, before Christ came into this world. And uh, I know as you listen to Hannah read, you heard the repetition of the pronouns, we, 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 and our, our, our. And you probably noticed that all the verbs, except for verse number 12, are past tense. He was bruised for our iniquities. He was punished for our sins. It's all in the past tense, even though Isaiah was writing 700 years before the incarnation. It's because God is not bound by time. He sees everything in the eternal present and Christ was crucified before the foundation of the world. The crucifixion and resurrection are not a mistake. It was in the plan of God, the eternal purpose of God before the creation of the world. And you were chosen in him before the creation. So Isaiah 53 explains the gospel. That's why I call it the gospel according to Isaiah. We're going to see in Isaiah 53, his humble birth, his common appearance, his agonizing suffering, his atoning, atoning death, and his resurrection and exaltation. Look at verses 1 and 2, and let's think about his humble birth. Isaiah 53, 1, Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. Notice verse 2, he grew up before him like a tender shoot. It, he didn't appear suddenly like a giant stately oak tree, but like a tender plant. He was born a baby, an infant, in Bethlehem. And he grew up in a carpenter shop in despised Nazareth. He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. Israel was dry ground politically, economically, spiritually. Um, it was occupied and ruled by Rome. The family tree of David had been cut down. He's not going to appear as a prince on, on a horse, but um, he's a peasant. You know, he doesn't even have a place to lay his head. So he's like a tender shoot. He's like a root out of a dry ground. Then he talks about his common appearance in the latter part of verse number two. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. You know, everybody has their idea about what Jesus looks like. And I think a lot of people would like to envision him as tall and strong and handsome and he'd stand out in the crowd and have this impressive royal appearance, kind of like a movie star. But Isaiah said he didn't have any beauty or majesty. There was nothing that made him stand out. He was like a common looking man. And then look at his, at his agonizing suffering. I'm going to read verses 3 to 7. We're going to spend some time on this section. Follow along in your Bible, please. Or you can follow along on the outline that Mark put on the uh, church website. But I think it's really important that you look at the Word of God and study the Word of God and let the Holy Spirit help illuminate God's Word as I discuss it. Verse 3. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces from, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. That means he was hated and people looked down on him. Verse four, surely he has took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace 
was upon him and by his wounds, by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. He did not open his mouth. Now I want to make eight, eight observations on this section that I've entitled his agonizing suffering. This is so dense and packed with so much meaning. But um, here's, here's the first one. I'm going to make eight observations. First, he was rejected. Verse three, he was despised. That means hated and rejected by mankind. John 1.11 says he came to his own and his own did not receive him. John 7, his brothers, even his own brothers rejected him. Judas betrayed him. Peter, he denied him. The rest of the apostles scattered and acted like they didn't. They all denied him. They ran away. And, um, and the common people in the street shouted, crucify him, crucify him. He was rejected and despised. And there is no doubt that this caused Jesus great pain because sometimes the pain of rejection can linger longer and hurt deeper than physical pain. Second, he was pierced. Look at verse five. But he was pierced for our transgressions. They pierced him five times. They pierced him in the hands and in the feet. And then after they... Uh, lifted him up and he hung for six hours. They pierced his side to make sure that he was dead. And out came um, blood and water. Third, he was crushed. Notice he was crushed for our iniquities. Jesus fell under the weight of the cross, but that's not what crushed him really. The primary burden that crushed him was our sin because uh, the Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Just all the sin of all mankind for all time, just wave after wave of sin just crushed him. He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us. Yeah. And so he was crushed for our iniquities. Fourth, he was punished. Look at verse 5. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. Uh, he was punished. He was tortured. The soldiers blindfolded him and they hit him in the face again and again. And then they would spin him around and say, come on, prophet, prophesy. Who was it that hit you? And they spit in his face. And you can imagine Jesus, his face was all swollen and bruised, had spittle all over him. Fifth, he was wounded. Verse five, by his wounds, we are healed. When I read that verse, I think about the cat of nine tails the, that, that they flogged him with. It wasn't a regular whip with one strand of leather. It had many strands of leather, um, nine strands of leather coming off of the handle and embedded in the end of those strands of leather, le leather were jagged pieces of rock and bone and metal and they stripped Jesus of his clothes tied him to a post bent over and then they beat him over and over and over Josephus calls this the intermediate death because many times people didn't make it through the scourging through the flogging I mean it just ripped the flesh off the bone and uh and he was just marred beyond human likeness. He didn't even look like a human being. He was just one mass of quivering human flesh. And Isaiah says, by his wounds, you are healed. Sixth, he bore our sin. Verse six, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Peter puts it like this, and he's, he's jumping from, I mean, he's using Isaiah. 
he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. Seventh, he was slaughtered. You know, he was led, verse seven, look at it. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. These people were very familiar with uh, animals being slaughtered because it happened at the temple all the time. It also happened, you know, on at their homes because um, they, they kept flocks of sheep and other animals that they ate and they sheared them for the wool and ate them. So they, would, they knew what it is to slaughter. But especially at the temple, I mean, it was just endless sacrifices, thousands and thousands of sacrifices. Like I said last week, like one bull after another, one ram after another, one lamb after another. Yeah, and there would be blood everywhere. It looked more like a murder scene than it did a worship service. And that's what it was supposed to look like because that's what they were going to do to Jesus. All that blood could not atone for sin, but it pointed to the one sacrifice that would atone for sin. And he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. This week I learned that, I hadn't seen this before, that there is an animal in, in many flocks called the Judas sheep and that sheep a judas like judas iscariot is trained to lead the flock and and they will lead them right to the slaughterhouse and you can see that those those sheep following the judas sheep and this is uh the picture he was led as a lamb to the slaughter to the slaughterhouse and uh, eight, he was silent. Verse seven, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, he did not open his mouth. Notice he says three times, he did not open his mouth. He was silent. He did not open his mouth. The Messiah was slaughtered like a lamb, the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And he was silent like a sheep being sheared is silent like a sheep being slaughtered. He was silent when he stood before the Sanhedrin and the chief priest in Matthew 27. In Matthew 26, it says he was silent in Matthew 27, he was silent before the chief priest describes the elders. In um, Mark chapter 15, he was silent before Pilate. Now, there were some times that he talked, like one time Pilate said, why don't you tell me who you are? You know, why don't you speak? Don't you realize that I have the power over your life? And Jesus said, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. He said those kinds of things, but by and large, he was silent. He was silent before Herod. You know, it was the silence of submission to the will of God. It was also maybe the silence of judgment because it's almost as if Jesus is saying, I taught openly in the streets, in the synagogues, in the temple. I, I preached and you heard about the forgiveness of God, the gospel. You heard about the kingdom and you would not listen. You have rejected me. You, you will not believe and you never will. So I have nothing more to say to you. You know, it's a silence of judgment and also the silence of submission to God. So they beat him and they whipped him and they pierced him and they slaughtered him. And Isaiah 52, 14 says, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his formed marred beyond human likeness. He didn't even look human because they had beat him so bad. 
And that was his atoning sacrifice. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet, who of his generation protested? Nobody did. They were shouting, crucify him, crucify him. For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. I think Joseph of Arimathea was a part of this prophecy being fulfilled. He borrowed a rich man's tomb for three days. That's all he needed it because he rose from the dead three days later. With the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. He didn't do anything wrong. He was a perfect sacrifice, the perfect lamb of God. And in fact, Pilate pronounced him innocent three times in Luke 23. And finally, he washed his hands. I am innocent of the blood of this man, of this just man. But I want you to notice verse number 10. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. You see, it was in God's plan. God did what Abraham could not do. God sacrificed his own son. It was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. Yes, people um, crucified Jesus, but ultimately it was God's sacrifice that he was offering. The father offering the son. And people were responsible. It didn't take away human responsibility. Here's the way Peter put it in on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2.23. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of some wicked men, have put him to death. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death. Because it was impossible for death to keep its hold in, on him. I love that. It was impossible for death to keep its hold on him because Jesus is the resurrection. He doesn't just raise us from the dead. He, he says, I am the resurrection. And you see resurrection in verses 10 to 12 of Isaiah 53, his resurrection and exaltation. Verse number 10, and though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of God will prosper in his hand. The will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he suffers, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. Do you see this resurrection language? And, his, and by his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. So in verse number 12, I want you to notice how the pronouns change from we to I because it is the Lord speaking. And uh, the tense of the verbs also changes. Up to this point, it's all been past tense. But now he, he used future tense. Verse 12, therefore I, if we were together, I'd say, everybody say I. This is God speaking directly. I will give him a portion among the great and he will divide spoils with the strong because he's poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. That is the amazing gospel message according to Isaiah his humble birth, his common appearance, his agonizing suffering, his atoning sacrifice, his resurrection and exaltation as King of kings and Lord of lords. He paid the penalty for your sin. And he, uh, he satisfied the justice of God. And he declares you righteous when you come to him and follow him. And it's nothing that you do. It's everything that he has done. So praise God for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I hope that, that the message has encouraged you and strengthened your faith in what God has done through our Savior, Jesus. Now, I'm going to, 
We're going to have our family prayer time. And Andrew is going to put the names of the elders on the screen, their names and telephone numbers. If you would like to contact them, you can call or text them and um, ask for prayer. If you have any need, just give them a call or send them a text. Right now, I'm going to pray for unspoken needs. Please bow with me. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray that you would hear all of our prayers that are rising to you right now, all of our needs, Lord. We pray that you would meet them and we pray with confidence in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. Amen. I love you all. Bye-bye.